you, you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Let's discover hard couple months, but it's this, this, this is nothing you can know what's up in the hood. Lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. Nearly 55 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated these very words in his I Have a Dream speech. Millions have watched that historic speech, yet it is not a part of dead history. Today we are witnessing in real time examples of overt racism, making his words ring more true than ever before. But is anyone actively working to fix these issues? This question is met with a resounding and emphatic yes. On January 15th, at the Metro YMCA on Chicago's near west side, students gathered for a series of workshops dedicated to the concept of social justice and to commemorate the memory and beliefs of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Kaden is going to share a little bit of words. You should go over there. Um, all right. So, um, and then because some of us um, were, you know, learning new skills and new, um, you know, we're just learning. Um, I want you to encourage uh, to give our encouragement to Kaden um, because this is something that is different for him to do. So, Kaden is going to queue up this video. Okay. So I've Been to the Mountaintop is a famously known speech delivered by Martin Luther King Jr. King gave a speech at the Mason Temple on April 3rd in the year 1968. This also happened to be the last speech that King ever gave because he was assassinated the following day. In the speech, King is calling to people of all races for unity and peace and urging people to join in on his boycotts and other nonviolent protests. He was challenging the U.S. to keep the promises that were being made to people, specifically people of color. And at the end of his speech, he mentions the possibility of dying for this cause but that he wasn't afraid of the outcome because he knew what he was fighting for it was worth it. Let's take a look at what MLK had to say and remember how strong and powerful he was today. Can you let them know? So you have um, the excerpt of this speech is coming around, so you'll also be able to um, listen to it or read along to it in a little bit. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Why MLK is so important today, I feel like, because he plays such a huge role in how we are today is like it's no way to erase him. Like the one of the leaders of the civil rights movement, you know, that's somebody who we have to look back to because we're, as an activist, you know, we want to study the history to find out where what went wrong, what went right. So he like showed us like the positives of activism and how like it can really like help in today's society with act activism and like not only to like let history repeat itself but how we can better it. Because the, the, the police car became a symbol of violence to many people, that, that, that was my reaction as well because I, I, I sympathize with it. They're like, oh crap, now he's gonna die. But it turns out he didn't. It turns out his friend was there. It is very similar to Palestinians when the, the simple faith Judaism was supposed to be 
uh, 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 symbol of protection, a symbol of, of faith, of, of, of communities. Oh. For Palestinians, it became, it became a symbol of violence. Why? Because it is the state of the state of Israel stamps it on the airplanes that bombs us. It's extremism. Okay, can I just want to say one thing? Can you go back for one yeah. second? So I'm a Jew. Yeah. And what used to be stamped on these military killing machines was the flag of the state of Israel. Right. That has been taken away and they use the Jewish star. Yeah. So me, I'm feeling like they're stealing my identity exactly. and using it to to kill off another people. They're so label. It, right, exactly. Exactly. And not only that, but like on the logos of their IDF, the, the Israeli uh, army, and in the, the logo of their air force, you know, they use the Jewish symbol. And this is this is problematic because that's not how it's supposed to be used. That's not how it's supposed to be. And this is offensive to both Jews and Palestinians, yeah. And another thing is, is they also make people who aren't necessarily Jewish wear those things and they're forced to join the oh. military at a certain age. So the military, yes, it is forced, but I'm not sure about the the, the kappa, I think it was called, the kappa? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I'm talking like they make people wear the stars. And oh, stuff. okay, yeah. It's like, and if they don't believe in that. So this is, yeah, so this is a problematic. The other the other issue that I, 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 I noticed is the, the monopoly of being understood, that's what I call it, monopoly of being understood. When a black man, you know, does something uh, uh, violent, and then, then the media covers it, what do they call it? What do they say? Like, you know, if a black man does violence or whatever, what do they call it in the media? Dogs, mm. criminal. When a brown man does something violent, what does the media call it? Terrorist. Terrorist. Mm. Yeah. When a white man does something terrible and, you know, shoots up something, what do they call it? He's mentally ill. Exactly. He's mentally ill. He's, he's his own wolf. So this is the, 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 the problem of representation. You know, when, when it's a white man, he's understood. He's like, oh, he's a troubled man. He's a lone wolf. He does not represent us as white people. But when it comes to blacks, when it comes to browns, people of color, it's always applied to the group. And this is the problem of the lone wolf versus the grouping, right? Where the American society um, has, or white people in the, in the American society, has a monopoly of being understood. And this is related to violence and racism. In Palestine, you can imagine something similar. When a Palestinian does something violent, what do they call it? They call him terrorist. Terrorist, right? Terrorist. When an Israeli Jew does something terrible, what do they call him? Freedom fighter. Well, I, I wouldn't say freedom fighter, but it's very similar to the way whites are treated in the U.S. He's a lone wolf. We condemn what he did, but he doesn't represent us. Whatever, right? But when it comes to Palestinian, it is stamped. And then there comes the issue of accountability, right? When we talk about police brutality here in the U.S. and and and, 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 and the Israeli army killing of uh, killings of Palestinian civilians in, in uh, Palestine, how do you imagine th things are? How are things here when it comes to police brutality? We've we've, we've, read, we've seen the news uh, over the years where uh, uh, many many people of color were killed by the police. What happened to the police uh, to the police who? Done these things. They get like they get like paid time off, or they get like it's like a vacation, right? They right. Don't, <laughs> don't, get, yeah. they don't get charged. You don't. They don't get charged. Some some do. Some are, are likely not to. You know, but they're not treated. They, they, there's no accountability when it comes to to to, to black bodies. Victims, basically, they want us in jail. So therefore, they're going to do what it takes. So what you want to say is, I do not consent to a search, no matter what. So if you're in your car, you get pulled over, um, what you still want to say is I do not consent to a search. So when this is taken to a court, the evidence is illegal. So if they find uh, a gram of weed on you in your car, and it's, it's no longer legal if you say I do not consent to a search unless they have a warrant. Now if they have a warrant, then they have access to search you. Um, another thing you want to practice saying is, am I free to leave? So if you're, the officer has not told you you've been arrested, you want to say, am I free to leave um, or am I under arrest? So if the officer says, if you ask, am I free to leave, and they say yes, you may proceed on with leaving. If they say no, then you're okay to assume that you are now under arrest, but don't take it. Um, and so again, 
Y'all remember when we spoke about FDLA and um, where we get our curriculum from and stuff like that? So FDLA, the cool thing about them is they have this hotline, the 24 hotline he was talking about. Um, the number is 1-800-LAW-REP-4. What? Oh, the number was 1-800-LAW-REP-4. And what this does is that means at any time, any Chicagoan, Chicago area, um, can call and have a free lawyer come to the station to represent you. They don't represent you in like real court or nothing like that, but at the station and things like that. So that way, if you ever you ever find yourself in a predicament, somebody else finds you in a predicament, or you find them in a predicament where they can use this, then you can call that number 1-800-LAW-REP-4, 24 hours. Um, they will come up there to the station and represent you. One thing you want to do when you encounter the police and to always remember is to control like your body language and how you speak. Remember how I talked about we can be very aggressive sometimes, um, you know, relentless almost. So we just always want to keep it in mind, especially police, they can be very disrespectful at times. And just watch how you say things and stuff like that. Well, I am here today basically because I was a part of the development team to have this come back another year so basically I was already included but um, also just to be around people who are like-minded like me who uh, believe in liberation of the people and um, fighting for our basic human rights basically. One workshop used a form of theater where participants formed frozen tableaus described as a dramatic scene formed by having people freeze in place. In doing this activity, these groups were instructed to demonstrate various forms of social injustice. And then we'll come together, okay? Two minutes, starting now. When I count to three, you're gonna go to your tableaus, okay? One. Can we all do it at the same time? No, 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 that would have been really interesting, right? Ready? One, two, three. Uh, no, so just look at their faces. Um, read the body language for us. Ooh. I can tell you you're wrong. <laughs> so this is the second year that we have been helping to organize this event uh, along with Chicago Freedom School and uh, Youth Empowerment Performance Project um, and the um, Warehouse Project, uh, Warehouse uh, forgetting the name of it but it, with Warehouse Project um, and we're doing it because we learned we've learned the hard way that we cannot focus just on the issue that was particularly of import to us which was the focusing on um, human rights and, and the Israeli-Palestinian struggle um, but that we really have to live this notion of intersectionality that we recognize that the issues that we're dealing with in the issue in, in the struggle around human rights in Palestine are completely tied to the issues that we're we're dealing with here in the United States around human rights and that if we're going to be effective in addressing these issues we have to recognize them and address them in both places so that's why we did it um, we are getting older we need to have um, youth take the leadership roles more and more and part of what we're doing this day for is to give youth a chance to know each other to work with each other to learn together and to move more and more into leadership positions Talk within your group, and I will be right there to give you your letter. Okay, we're here today because we really know the importance of what we're doing in the community. And as youth, we know that the next generation is on us. So we would like to learn from like our like predecessors, the ones who are older than us, what they've done and how they've done it, so we can like continue their amazing work in our community to tr truly like gain like equality. Well, MLK is still relevant for two reasons, actually. Well. One, because although there's been like huge progression in black liberation, I, we're still not 100% there yet. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. So it's important to you know, remember MLK, what he's done, so we can reflect and see what we can do. You know. So my name's Evan Oak and I work with Circles and Ciphers and that's why I'm here. Circles and Ciphers is a hip hop infused restorative justice organization based on Chicago's north side. 
Uh, we sit in peace circle, we have a talking piece, we pass it around, we deeply pay attention to one another, and we pay attention to the tensions that are within us. And so it's really a space where you come to kind of release and explore and allow yourself in a new way. Um, luckily, it also functions as a conflict resolution process. So not only do we do circles in prisons, in group homes, in public schools, in the community, but we also take on conflict resolution uh, opportunities. So just about like 30 minutes ago, I was asked by one of the groups here uh, to do a conflict resolution circle for them. So basically, if people have tension and they want to call the police or they want to expel someone, that's, that's because America does not teach us how to resolve conflict. And there are ways to speak about our problems. And so we provide a pedagogy, a methodology through which to approach conversations about difficult topics. I think that Martin Luther King t today is still relevant for the key fact that everything that he stood for um, and all of the he was fighting for is still relevant. All of these issues are still relevant to this day. Um, the integration of different races and the oppressions that we are facing as well as the different values that are being and laws that are being taken from different subgroups of people. Um, how some identities are marginalized and some aren't. Um, I think that you know Martin King's values towards the I have a dream speech is still relevant today. Um, the reaching the mountaintops is still relevant. I think that it's all a universal dream. I think that it's just something that was it started then, but it's still continuing today. Um, it's what do we call this? Um, legacy. His legacy. Yes. Um, is what we call it, a legacy and that's why he's still relevant because his legacy is still alive because we're still fighting the same struggle. Mm -hmm. We're still struggling the same struggle um, today in 2018 mm -hmm. um, that our black people struggled back then and even more so now we have different different communities like the Palestinians who are dealing with the same issues that we dealt with back in the 60s and the 70s exactly. and whatnot and are still dealing with today the same exactly. systematic oppression that we are, that we are facing today uh, we faced then and that's why it's still relevant because the fight is still here and we are still fighting we're still living this struggle and that's why he is still relevant yes. today in our technologically advanced world 1968 may seem like ancient history but the problems of that time still live with us today and if anything some of those problems have even grown worse undisguised acts of racism are seen throughout our land and it's up to us to assert our rights as citizens to stand up to the inhumanity of these attacks. Yeah, we have a, we have a right to, to be very concerned, you know, about going backwards because, so, I mean, when, I mean, I know we, we all have our own agenda, but it's like, you know, the Trump, actually, he's not the fact that he's just the poster boy, you know? So he's really not the president, it's actually his cabinet who's gonna be the president because, and what we would know about him, his education and everything else, he is not politically, he was never politically inclined on anything. I don't feel like my voice is really heard because uh, I don't have money, I'm not wealthy. Uh, and I want to know what is a way, what, yeah, what way can we get our voice heard without there being some type of revolution in America? I feel like if we do want to see change in you, do you want to hear your voice change, you should actually get off your ass and organize so I decided to write a letter to my past self um, and basically speaking on decisions that were made for me um, but have helped me along the way. Um, so, dear me, you have seen a lot these past few years and most of which you haven't had the choices um, to choose your battles. Custody wasn't up to you nor was it up to your parents, it was up to Grandma Alice. She decided that your best interest um, and from then on out, you learn to take in those who care about um, you, uh, no matter what the circumstance. You learn that uh, life doesn't always deal out the best hand, and you learned how to play the game with each win and each loss um, was a lesson learned. You were instilled with pride for where you came from. Your choices from here on out will be the ones that shape your future, not the ones that were made for you. Those choices just got you to the start line. Ready, set, live your best life. If you hadn't came out, you know, if you hadn't shared your yourself with your parents, do you still believe that you would have would helped the community? Confined. I feel like I would still be condemned in a place where I didn't want to be. And 
my voice wouldn't have been heard and everything that I probably would have said or did, it would have been false. It would have been not true to who I am, you know, because I'd have been, like I was telling them, I always tell people, like, practice what you preach. Always up encouraging everybody else to, you know, be who they are and all, don't let the odds, like, don't let people's judgment define who you are. And if I would have still, if I would have held that secret with them, I felt like I wouldn't have been true to my word because I still would have been hiding a part of me that was inevitable to hide because of who I am and how I carry myself. The essence that I give off is, is, is scream femininity. So it's like, I wouldn't have been true to who I was. I wouldn't have been, I would have been a hypocrite. I think he did two things which are so closely connected and what we thirst for. One, he's identifying the struggle. He's identifying the oppression. He's naming it and he is working towards it or he was working towards it and towards the, the eradication of all of the evils that he identified. Um, and he did it in a way that brought people together and that gave people hope that there was reason to engage in the struggle, that it wasn't struggle for the struggle's case. That, and he kept talking about it. there's this long arc of justice, but that eventually we will come to a just ending. And I think that people are so... Um, desirous to have that be the way that we think about our work and there's no one who has embodied that as as well in our memories as Martin Luther King. As we really know the importance of what we're doing in the community and as youth we know that the next generation is on us so we would like to learn from like our like predecessors the ones who are older than us what they've done and how they've done it so we can like continue their amazing work in our community to tr truly like, gain like equality. It's important to recognize that it's not just Martin Luther King who spoke about these injustices, who gave his life in working for these injustices, and, and said that it is important for us to commit ourselves to the struggle, that there have been people beyond and before Martin Luther King who have done this as well. And in no way does saying that you revere and celebrate Martin Luther King's life negate the value of all of these other people in the past and present um, who are doing this as well. But I think it's also important to recognize that each of the, the, these different people that you mention um, lived in different times, worked in different environments, and they too had these struggles, and they too had to draw on the resources that were available in their environments, in their times, to address these things. And the same thing is true for us. We do not live in the same time that Martin Luther King, and we have very different political situation right now. We have different environmental issues. There are all different things that have changed, but that doesn't mean that we don't have the resources, we don't have the wherewithal to address them. So I think recognizing that it wasn't one person that it is a, a an ongoing group of, of leaders and, and people who have inspired us, whether they be prophets or they be people who simply are committed to engaging in the struggle um, that both motivate us and inform us. I think going along with that, the idea of setting boundaries and respecting the boundaries set forth by other people is really important because I think like we would get a lot further in the world if we were more careful in how we set the boundaries up for ourselves and respected those boundaries set up by other people because I know like in just thinking about what you just said like if you I may disagree with you but if we are careful in how our boundaries are set in that conversation we're much more able to have a constructive conversation as opposed to if I've set my boundaries and you've crossed that boundary then I can't be productive or have a conversation with you in any type of productive care and careful way and another thing is um, I've learned throughout the years um, is know your self-worth. Like if you know your self-worth, then you can uh, only imagine how somebody else feel about their self-worth. Knowing how somebody feel about themselves would help better your communication skills with others and learn how to like um, be unified as one. It's clear that that you know, I'm 60 years old right now, and many of the people who are helping to organize this are in their 50s and 60s. And it is no longer our 
struggle alone. That in fact the the struggle has been shared and is and and the work on it is being shared by many other people. And it's um, it's really important for us to not step aside because well, there's work to be done. And as far as I'm concerned, as long as you're breathing, you've got work to do. But to recognize that um, that the youth and um, and people that are in all different generations have a great deal to add to this conversation and a great deal to add to the struggle and that we are dependent on working collaboratively with each other to be able to address these issues. So I'm thrilled that they're here. I'm thrilled that they want to be a part of this work and that we can work together in sharing the experiences we've had, the knowledge that we've gained, and learn the great deal that we have to learn from them about working in this day and age.